Carrie Byron, everybody. You know, let's start with something simple. What were your aspirations growing up? Um, well, I always wanted to get into special effects because I'm a sculptor and I'm very arty and uh, it seemed a very practical way to kind of involve sculpture in my life that didn't involve starving because I really like to eat. <laughs> starving artist was not my aspiration and I saw the making of Thriller when I was a kid and I thought that was cool. I wanted to make monsters. I wanted to be Jim Henson, do what he did and uh, that kind of led me into this bizarre career. You know, most people don't realize that you're, I mean, they look at you and think, okay, this is just a science geek, but you're really an artist. So talk about your, your art and the fact that how you like to, like to create a little bit of art every day and, um, and while you're talking, you know, we're going to go through some slides of your art to show what it looks like, you know, okay. over here on the side, just so you know what's going on here. But, oh, yeah. Oh, that's um, yeah, talk a bit about your art <laughs> and, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I've always used art to kind of quarantine the world into a small place that I can try to explore. And I feel like that's what science does as well, is you just start with a question and explore it until you feel like you've gotten closer to an answer. Um, I, <laughs> these are some explosion paintings I do, because when I got into Mythbusters, I started to really like blowing stuff up. And it turns out it's not that hard to source black powder and, you know, <laughs> Electric matches and uh, the internet is wonderful for that. I mean, no, don't try this at home. I don't do this. These are little critters that um, I have been playing with lately because I'm a creative parent. Um, I figure I need to give her something interesting to talk about in therapy someday. So why not help her out? So when she has bad habits, um, we create a little monster that's supposed to cure her of her bad habits. This may not be healthy, but uh, we started with the poop monster because she wouldn't flush the toilet ever while potty training, and that terrified her enough that we kept moving on until we got to things like the nail-biting monster, and then we came up with stories on how these little totems were going to cure her, such as the, the booger monsters live inside your nose, and they eat boogers, and if you pick your nose, you're stealing their food, and they're gonna crawl out of your nose, look for the next hole, crawl in your ear, eat your brain, and then you might not learn to read. <laughs> and just, you know, stuff like that. Sounds like a children's book. <laughs> it does. Maybe you should write that, that. We are starting to maybe put those into a children's book, because after years of making little monsters, and all her friends loving the little monsters, we thought we would maybe put it in one place that everybody can send their kids to therapy. <laughs> okay, so you're obviously a smart person. You graduated magna cum laude from college, I believe. What drove you into film and sculpture in college? Um, well, I started in junior college with a sculpture class that I found extremely inspiring and a, very, you know, a couple very passionate teachers. And um, it, it kind of evolved so that my life was going to be very artistic and I you know, then went to school in San Francisco which is another very arty place and uh, you know, kept doing art from there and I thought for a while I was going to do fine art sculpting but that's not as much fun as special effects so that brought me to Jamie Heinemann's shop. I wanted to try to do the special effects and turns out that you can do some really fun stuff at a toy prototyping or um, prop shop kind of thing. And I got an internship with Jamie Heineman, and it just turns out that my first day trying to be a toy prototyper was also the first day that Mythbusters started filming. So I accidentally ended up on TV instead of <laughs> toy prototyping. I want to point out the first thing she said there. She started a junior college. Let's keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think many people would think that you know, art and science are on opposite ends of the spectrum. I mean, that they're not necessarily even related at all. That's how, crazy talk. How would you respond to that? Yeah, respond to that. <laughs> well, I think art and science basically have the, the sort of same momentum. I mean, you start with a question, you're investigating, it's about fostering a curiosity. And I think art and science used to be thought of as, um, you know, on the same table. It used to be the kind of thing where you'd be doing sort of you know, Tesla-style experiments in the same parlors as you were looking at beautiful masterworks, um, you know, and now it, they've separated them out as if art and science are different things, but I think fostering a curiosity is in the same realm. So 
I personally think that if you teach art in conjunction with science and mathematics, people will be able to connect the dots in different ways and be able to answer questions that maybe if they only focused in one discipline, they wouldn't be able to answer. You did a bunch of traveling, I believe, worldwide after college. How did that influence your career? Um, I think it influenced my life. I mean, this was before the internet, so it was also pre-9-11, so the world was really open to me, and it wasn't um, something that you could just Google. You know, you had to actually go meet and explore. So I started backpacking, and I went around the world. I focused on Southeast Asia, and I got to spend a month in Egypt, which I don't think I could do anymore. It was, it was very cool to meet people doing different things, see their lifestyles, find out um, why they were who they were, and I feel like it gave me a world view. And um, it also kind of opened me up in a way where I love to be wrong and proven wrong. I like to learn, I like to explore, and I think that naturally brought me into the course that this wild life has brought me into. Of all places you've traveled to, what's your favorite? really tough because it's you know it's they're all so different it's like what's your favorite chocolate like come on <laughs> what I, is your favorite chocolate <laughs> i don't I can't decide i really really loved egypt i found it very hard to travel in but i learned so much and there was so much adventure and by the time i had gotten there i was very open to adventure and I got to see things that um, I don't think you can see anymore. They've closed up a lot of the tombs, and I don't think you can travel there again. And I spent weeks traveling in a felucca down the Nile back when I was 23 and immortal and could just live without showers and money. And I got to see you know, the stars next to the pyramids. and It was, it was incredible. I live without showers every day. I don't know what <laughs> Um, you, know, you talked about Jenny Hyman a little bit ago, entering on a show. No, there's a little story behind that. You want to share how you did that <laughs> in a little more detail? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of lore with that. I, okay, so my first day, I still get embarrassed about this. It's hilarious. Um, my first day working uh, at Jamie Heineman's shop when they started filming Mythbusters, they were doing a myth about a very large woman who sat down in an airplane toilet when she flushed the toilet, the suction pulled her down so that she couldn't stand and they had to land the plane to get her off the toilet. And um, they, needed a, a, they needed a model of a butt for this experiment and Jamie and Adam weren't at the point where they were letting go of their dignity, I guess, enough to use their butt. So they exchanged, Jamie said, if I would get a 3D scan of my butt, he would let me learn the software to turn it into a mold. Um, and it was kind of some rudimentary software, <laughs> software back then, but I thought that was great because I wanted to get more knowledge for special effects, so yes. And he said he'd pay me $100 for the rights and then they could put it on TV, and I was like, okay, who's ever gonna watch the Discovery Channel? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I let them do a scan of my butt while wearing a cat suit, and then I put it into a modeling program where I could sculpt it into a much larger behind using a lot of reference from the internet because at that point the internet was really only good for finding reference of naked butts <laughs> mostly so I that was easy um, and then uh, I turned into this very large behind and it was it was kind of fun to see it go from a computer scan to a physical actual thing that hung on the wall for a decade and now we're done. No. <laughs> okay, so you've actually had very little science training, so to speak, or education, um, but you're a very curious person. So talk about how, how you've embraced science. Well, I think we all do. I mean, we used it as a tool on the show. It wasn't We didn't set out to make a science show at all. We just, uh, you know, used it as a tool. It just turns out that the scientific method is the perfect narrative for busting a myth. You know, it brings you through a storyline that comes to a conclusion at the end. Um, I think that I didn't have the same kind of science education they have now, which is very experiential, it's very get your hands dirty, which is what Mythbusters did for me. What science classes are doing now with sort of um, getting away from just learning the components of a cell to dropping eggs from the rooftop and trying to make sure they don't crack, use your physics, that's what Mythbusters did for me. It let me get my hands dirty and so now I've really gotten into it to the point where I got to host a science fair. Me! I didn't, I didn't even really take advanced science courses when I was in high school. 
Well, and, and talking about science, you know, one of the problems and one of the issues that we, we, that we face in education all the time is getting women especially excited about careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. How would you speak to women to get them excited about these areas? I mean, that's tough because I feel like women already are and they don't start losing interest till it gets to be like a junior high age and I used to think it was just they needed to see role models and see people just like them but after going out and doing a lot of things talking to girls about it it comes down to a couple different reasons um, if you've got a supportive family or a, a father that is very into science girls tend to continue on because they really look up to their daddies so a strong father figure that's passionate about science seems to work at least in all the successful women in that field that I've talked to also, I think that I found that finding a support network um, where other people are interested in what you're interested in is important. So that if you are the one girl in the science class, you feel outnumbered and you might give up, because we're very communally based. But now we have the internet. And if you can find other girls that are also interested in coding or biology or you know chemical engineering you can reach out and talk with them about your experiences and kind of keep that support that keeps you going okay so let's go back to Mythbusters for a minute you know talk about some of your experiences on the show and what were some of your favorite experiences that's a lot of experiences to pull from I you know I loved working in the group. I really enjoyed working with Tori and Grant and Jamie and Adam because everybody's so different and they all approach problem in such hilarious different ways. But some of my favorite experiences is when we were all a little bit of um, fish out of water, like when we'd go to the Bahamas and test sharks. Because you kind of know what's going to happen when you're going to wire a bomb, you know the steps, it's going to go off, super exciting and fun, but you can't predict when a shark is going to try to bite you for absolutely no reason. And that, that always got the best reactions. You know, when you watch Mythbusters, you kind of get the feeling that, that all you're seeing is like the tip of the iceberg, you know, that there's a whole lot of stuff happening below the water that nobody sees. Kind of go into what, what had to happen to make a show occur. I mean, what, 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 had, what did you have to do behind the scenes to actually pull off an episode? Yeah, I mean, you're definitely seeing the edited version, so you only see an hour of what took us, you know, two weeks to do, or sometimes months. I mean, we'd start out with a lot of researchers. We have researchers behind the scene, um, people that have to get permits for weird things, you know, like, hey, we're going to wrap a pig, drop it from a helicopter into a lake. Cool. What kind of permit? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes on that takes months then we have sort of these production meetings where we sit around and they think okay how are we going to test people's reaction time to slapping okay we have to build a machine this machine's never been built before how are we going to build a machine that slaps someone repeatedly the same way every time and what kind of hand are we going to use are we going to create a hand are we going to go buy a hand it's all it's all a kind of a crazy process once you get from there to the actual filming, we film for about two weeks, and you get to see just the best moments. All the screw-ups, all the funny jokes. You don't usually see the not funny jokes. There's a lot of those. Do they have hand shops in California where you can go buy a hand? I'm just um, So, yes. Mr. S. Leather has a full wall of different shaped rubber Okay, hands. we have... Um, on Mythbusters, you guys blow a lot of stuff up. A lot of stuff. <laughs> you um, asked. Yeah, I, know. I, <laughs> I don't sure lie. You guys blow a lot of stuff up all the time. Yes. And it, it's like nonstop. Have there ever been any accidents? Not with explosions because we have a very strong safety protocol and we are working with experts. We found early on, you want to set a fire, you call a fireman. You want to blow up something, you call the bomb squad. You want to shoot something, you call the police and they help you. They're very safe. Where we have all of our accidents are things like the bandsaw in the shop where Adam almost cut off his fingers and, uh, you know, a slippery floor broke my knee. Like the little stuff. That's where we had accidents. Um, not anything super duper horrible. All of us still have all our digits, mostly. What was your favorite explosion? I really like... Um, explosions with fuel because they look more like the movies more like what you think is an explosion like c4 is going to give you a good bump in the chest and ampho is more of a kind of a lingering push with more of a shattering but when you have a fuel like propane it gives you a big 
growling, fiery, billowing, beautiful explosion that looks great on high speed. So when we took a Gatling gun and we shot into a giant propane tank, it gave us one of those explosions. When we used coffee creamer, aerated it, and then, ex it, I guess that's more of an ignition, and then it caught on fire in the air from a flare, it gave us that billowy, dark smoke and red fire, and I'm standing sort of crazy, so ask me another question before Homeland Security takes me away. <laughs> I gotta tell you, there's something incredibly awesome about a woman talking that passionately about an explosion. <laughs> Sorry, honey. You know, I feel like the bomb squad was a pretty fun job. I didn't realize how much that they kind of just sit around and they got excited to come to our experiments because they actually got the practical explosions because I guess they don't go off as much as you think. Okay, so... In other people's lives, I guess. <laughs> during your time on Mythbusters, what did you dislike the most? Ah, let's see. I disliked the fact that a lot of our locations didn't have bathrooms. That's the, yeah. It's just, yeah. I had to start to lobby porta potties brought in, and that was the nice place to go potty. Okay, who do you admire most in life and why? <sighs> you know, I have, uh, I, I'm always looking for role models um, that are close by so that I can access them. I have a producer on the show who I, I think is amazing, the, that old head of Science Channel, Debbie Myers, I just, I would rake her for knowledge. Um, I, I'm always looking for somebody that I can model myself after that's close to me because I find when I meet my heroes, sometimes I just, I'm too shy to ask them the questions I need to. So I, I usually get women that are just a little bit older than me who have accomplished amazing things. Um, or, or not older than me, like a Debbie um, Sterling from Goldie Blocks. She just invented a toy a line that's helping girls get interested in science. And I love listening to people like her that she's just so passionate about kind of inspiring people that she brings that into her life. Okay, so a side question here. If you yeah. could have dinner with three people in life, or in history, of all history, not counting me, yeah. who would it be? God, it changes all the time. This, is a, this would be a different answer every day, and I've got a couple typicals, like Ben Franklin. He just seems like he'd be super fun and creative and interesting. He's done so many weird things, and I, I love his story, and I think everybody has that answer. Um, I would put Frida Kahlo in there, because she is a vision of strength and beauty and art that I would love to pick her brain. And then this last slot changes a lot. Um, clearly, Jim Henson was my hero, and I would love to meet him. But today, um, it would be Bukowski, because I, have been, I, <laughs> I was just reading one of his poems this morning, The Laughing Heart, and I found it to be such a beautiful piece of poetry that I would like to ask him about it. Okay, great. Now, along with Mythbusters, you've been involved in a number of other things. Um, on the Science Channel, for instance, you had Head Rush. Mm -hmm. um, and you also did a, a show called uh, Punkin Chunkin, or Pumpkin Chunkin, or Pumpkin, Pumpkin Chunkin. Chunkin. You know, yep. talk, talk about those for a little bit. Uh, well, for a while, science was doing sort of science sports, so we, Pumpkin Chunkin was one where you have to lob a pumpkin as far as you can by any mechanical means, uh, being air guns, catapults, trebuchets, and these things were huge. We're talking the size of a building. It's not just like they're throwing them. They are throwing them up to a mile, and it is chaos. And they do it out in Delaware, and it was a huge event, and hundreds of thousands of people showed up, and it was a beautiful kind of marriage of wild guerrilla science and television. So it was very fun. Uh, we also did a show called Large and Dangerous Rocket Ships, which was a competition about by uh, amateur rocketry enthusiasts where they would make these insane giant rockets that they'd have to close down airspace uh, to actually launch and they would be launching everything from uh, a mannequin bride that at Apogee would have a baby and they'd both have little parachutes and come down to the ground uh, <laughs> to a tiki bar which was launched into the air and it was kind of watching the thought process and some of the really complicated uh, computer systems to map out where things would land was really fun to engage in. I mean, they're throwing pumpkins, but they're using science that NASA would use to track rockets. Talk about Head Rush a little bit. So, Head Rush, uh, one of the people that I said I admire, Debbie Myers, um, was kind of helped me push this through is uh, it was supposed to be aimed at women uh, at 12 or 13 years old um, who were 
keep them interested in science and make it fun and exciting. So for a while we had Head Rush on Science Channel, which was you know, doing some, you know, engaging in small scale experiments you could do at home, as well as talking to people who had science in their life, everyone from Michio Kaku to Tony Hawk using math to create ramps. It was fun. So I, I watched these, um, I, I watched a number of them online, and I get the, I get the feeling that, that, that these were just designed to make science fun. Oh yeah, I mean that's kind of, everything's gotta be fun. Life's too short not to have fun. Science should be fun. Okay, so what would, what would people be most surprised to know about you? God, I, I'm such a blabbermouth. I think I tell everybody everything. Uh, <laughs> Come on, pick one. Um, dig deep, dig deep. Dig deep. Um, <laughs> I don't, God, hmm. Okay, so here, you spent, you spent 10 years working with a bunch of guys on the show. Yes. Where you're the only woman on the show. Yes. What, what, what was the most embarrassing thing that occurred to you while, while doing that? Oh, God. I mean, on the show, I handled everything from poop to vomit to semen. Like, I told you how to get the, that's not how I got the job. I just, they, they, no, it's, we did have one, we had one myth. We had one myth where we had, there was a Civil War myth about a guy who got shot through his genetic legacy to, uh, and, and it, the, the mini ball that went through him went into a woman's uterus and they say she got pregnant and it was one of those miracle births. So we had to prove it, so we needed, this is back when we were a real scrappy outfit and we needed a bag of genetic legacy and people just don't give that stuff away, so everybody in the crew brought in a sample. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I would have I thought- I had to count the viable specimen after the shoot and it's just that's very vomity it was science i wore gloves <laughs> two pair so i would have i would have picked something different i would have thought maybe you would have been a little more <laughs> little, i've got so many it's I'm like some people have to one. think some people have to choose i just have so many to choose from they're embarrassing so instead of being Princess Leia, other than that, if, if you could go back and, and do anything else right now, other than what you love doing, mm -hmm. pick, and pick something else that you would think you might love doing, what would that be? <laughs> I would love to be a puppet maker in Prague. <laughs> Those guys looked really happy, and they were just making dolls all day. Fine art sculptor, sure, if that would be a possibility. Boy, I don't know where to go with that. I know. Puppet maker in <laughs> Prague. I lived in Prague for, for a good month and I went to their, their marionette shows are incredible and it's not just like you know, funny, goofy little marionette shows, it's like they're doing Orpheus and have these incredible puppets and for, there was a minute there I was like, I could do this, I could live here. Have you ever made a puppet? Yeah, I make a lot of weird little critters in my shop. Okay, so <laughs> you're currently on a show on Travel Channel, or yes. on, uh, where basically you go to amusement parks. Talk about this. It is called Thrill Factor, and it is the science of thrill rides. So Tori and I host the show, and we go all around the country to crazy roller coasters and thrill rides, um, and uh, test the science of them. And it's it's for Travel Channel. We also did a Halloween special where we got to test the science of fear and go into some haunted houses and. Hopefully we get renewed next summer because that was a fun job. Here, go ride a roller coaster by yourself. No lines. What do you, what do you want to do 10 years from now? I mean, you're involved in this and a whole lot of other stuff. So what, what do you want to be doing 10 years from now? God, I couldn't even, 10 years ago, I couldn't tell you I'd still be doing this. I think it's crazy. I mean, I just hope I have a really fun career. I still want to do the kind of wild stuff I do. And I guess when I get tired of being on camera, slowly move back and make other people do weird stuff as long as I keep get to go get you know it's I just really enjoy having fun I mean who doesn't that's a dumb thing to say <laughs> well, you talked about the fear this is uh, this next slide this is not fun I, I can't imagine being cooped up into a, uh, a, a coffin oh this is like the coffin this. one yeah. oh I hate this one so, so the question has nothing to do with that other than the fact that what do you hope people say about you when you're gone <laughs> She lived well. <laughs> the only people that I really care that know that I did well are my, I want my daughter to just be proud of me. Oh, I'm sure she will be. Let's hope. She'll probably hate me like all kids do in their teens, but she'll and, get over and, it. And she will. As a she'll parent, love me she again. Will. Okay. But she'll still love you deep down. <laughs> Good. Which is asking for $20. Okay, so we have some time for questions now from the audience. Uh, yes, I, um, and, and hang on for a minute um, we, as the mics are brought to you and then so everybody can hear your question. Hopefully you're not armed with video clips. 
Hi, my name is Kylie. I'm a big fan. Hi. And being a woman, I've dealt with gender equality in careers and jobs. And I was just wondering how being a woman has helped or hindered you with your career choice. And what advice can you give to other women? I feel like it's done both because uh, it, it's definitely a, a narrower um, field. I, I definitely have had less competition because there was not a lot of girls doing what I was doing or interested in what I was interested at the time that I was coming up. I feel like things have changed and there's a lot more opportunity. But I also worked for 70 cents on the dollar a lot, a lot, and had to fight tooth and nail. And, you know, quite honestly, Tori and Grant haven't had to deal with some of the really gross sexist things like, you know, if I eat a taco, people are asking me if I'm pregnant. I'm like, I'm just bloated, come on. You're really gonna put that on the internet? The, you know, it's, it's definitely, I get, got questions on my credentials more often than they did when we all had, you know, the same level of degree and the same level of experience. I had to prove myself harder and more often. That question over here. Just makes you stronger. <laughs> what did it feel like to be a 10 woman? To be a what? A ten woman. Ten woman. Oh, ten! You mean when they painted the paint on me? Yeah. Okay, so that was a myth we did for the tin man where they said he suffocated underneath the paint that they painted on him. And it, San Francisco's not that warm. It was freezing. It was super cold. And I am a bit shy and having to wear the, the bathing suit-like thing on television was tough for me because I'm just not that, yeah, that was, that was a little, little rough. <laughs> okay, other questions? We got one over here, I thought, right here, second, third, third row. Hi, so my name is Andrew, and when you're getting into something strange like prop making or toy manufacturing or something like that, uh, where would you say to start looking for information on that? Like, I know I started with uh, Adam's channel, Tested, on YouTube. Is, is that the kind of thing you're trying to get into? Um, mine's more of a hobby. What's that? <laughs> what is it? Um, it actually is from Adam. I got into prop collecting mm -hmm. and prop manufacturing. Well, what I do, or what I have always advised, I mean, this was kind of my goal, was to find somebody who's doing what you do and then just pester them until they help you. That's how, what I did with Jamie. Like, I just started showing up at his shop working for free until he gave me a job. And then when I got that job, Mythbusters happened. But, you know, so... I, I guess you got to be really lucky. No. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, just, yeah. You want Adam's phone number? You could start pestering him. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm not giving that out. I'm just kidding. But no, I really, just find, find yourself somebody that you can work for free for, because anybody will accept free labor and just absorb everything. I say internships are the best way to your career path, because you really get to learn and just you're at an age right now where you can work for free and it's not gonna be that big a deal. You don't even have to shower. We already talked about this. I, I thought the word I saw when it came to Jamie Heineman was you stalked him. I mean, I wouldn't say stalking because he let me into the shop. I worked for free, come on. Jamie is notoriously a cheapskate and he would charge for my labor, but then I would work on those jobs. I never got paid for any of the toy prototyping I did, and I guarantee he charged them an arm and a leg. Okay, so there you have it. <laughs> internships. Stalk, stalk people through internships. <laughs> question back we in the actually, back. Uh, sorry, we actually have a Twitter question oh, okay, from great. at Justin Brady. He says, do you think STEM, the STEM movement should be changed to STEAM? Adding Absolutely. The a. Put the A in STEAM, make it science, technology, engineering, art and mathematics because that is, a, I, I feel like it, using every part of your brain and um, adding art into your curriculum is actually going to be very important. Great. Question over here, I saw. Uh, I was wondering, did you ever go up and pet his mustache? I'm probably, it looked very tempting. I'm probably the only one that ever has. <laughs> what would you describe the feeling of his mustache? <laughs> Very beardy, just normal. It wasn't made of like, you know, antimantium or anything, like is rumored. Nerd reference and everybody who laughed. Nerds, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, next question. Yeah, over here. Um, about the internships and pestering people until they help you and everything. Um, would you give that same advice to someone who wants to get into special effects? Um, and also, what kind of classes would you advise taking for that? 
Yeah, I mean, in school, I took, uh, you know, I, I did film studies and I did art because they didn't have a special effects uh, sort of uh, curriculum to go on. So I kind of created my own and convinced my counselors that that could be my major was, you know, special effects. Um, I, I definitely think try to get an internship if you can. I mean, special effects, it's a little tough because you have to definitely go someplace like Los Angeles to get an internship for that. So it's, it's a big move. But I think internships for anything is really important. As far as classes, I don't know. I wish I knew. I would have taken those classes. And for the record, once again, she started a two-year school. Just want to point that I out. I went for three years, but it was a two-year school. <laughs> We, we have a few students on the four or five year plan too, so. I had to like three jobs at the time. I love junior college for that because I could go to the, the, the community college and still work really hard and actually I worked my way through school and I think that that was very character building. So I was just wondering, uh, over your time on Mythbusters, are there any myths that you did not test and wish you did? Um, there were tons of myths that we didn't test, but usually not because um, we didn't want to, or sometimes they were just too hard. Like, I would have loved to have tested 21 grams, because I think that's a really interesting myth, but somebody has to die. So, <laughs> logistically, that was difficult, though we did come up with a way to do it, but we'd need a volunteer if somebody was on their deathbed. There was this whole thing with scales and containing their fluids. But, I mean, we could have done it. It's, you know, it just would have been hard. Or 360 race car, where a race car had so much downforce that it could uh, Formula One could race upside down in a tunnel for a long period of time, you know, we, but we also would have to f build a helical track and find somebody to lend us a Formula One race car, which is very expensive. Insurance just isn't going to cover that. So I mean, would have liked to have tested some of those myths, but I just don't think logistically it was going to ever happen. So, okay, over here. I have, uh, do I go? Yeah, go okay, sorry. Um, so with pestering people for getting information, where, do you, where would you usually go for finding the right people for that? Um, you know, I, back when I was doing it, I actually asked teachers from the programs that I was interested in because most of your teachers probably have this vast knowledge and network of people that could probably help you out. And, you know, it's a great, re your college has a great resource, I'm sure, for any field that you're trying to get into. But uh, lucky for you, you've got the internet. You could find people, research them, get their background, and then when you go talk to them, just give them your knowledge of them. People love talking about themselves, and they will probably give you some sort of interest and tell them that you are willing to do what it takes to work for free. I mean, sometimes people will create an internship for you. Question over here. Hi, I'm a religious studies major, so I was kind of wondering what the most interesting thing you ran into, like culturally, was. Uh, involved with religious studies or just culturally in general, or like traveling kind of thing? Yeah, through traveling, but I would say culturally, just overall, like that giant umbrella. <laughs> that is huge question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, traveling, I think religious studies is a very interesting uh, direction because I always found religion to be extremely interesting. I loved, I, when I was hanging out in Egypt, I had a bunch of these little Bedouin girls who thought that everything I did was going to take me to the fire, as they used to tell me on a daily basis. But they still wanted to be my friend. And I loved that who I was and who they were were so different culturally, but we could still brush our teeth in the morning together. Okay, question over here. Hi, I'm Jesse, and I'm going to do computer forensics. And I was curious, what was like the coolest computer programs you used in MythBusters? Um, goodness, they're all outdated now. They're not even that interesting. Uh, computer, you're a smart one. You're going to that's great computer forensics. I mean, seriously, the internet came about in a big way while we were on the show. We started with books, so I mean, would the internet count? <laughs> I mean, specifically, we, I think everything that we've done was so outdated by now that it wouldn't actually be that cool. Over here? Yeah, okay, so how did you feel when you got the news that Mythbusters is ending? Um, well, I left the show about two years ago, so I kind of saw it was slowly coming to a halt. So, it, I mean, it was really sad to end one thing, but I'm a, it's, it's sort of, 
it's sort of good that it, it, it ran its course and it did so many amazing things and everybody's going to great places. You know, Jamie's retiring and he's working with like military contracts and Tori Grant and I are filming a new show now that's also sort of esoteric and heady and interesting and still very sciencey and we will soon be able to announce where and what it is, but let's just say it's, it's, it's not busting myths, but it's still that same sort of essence and passion of information. So we're, we're all kind of moving on in interesting ways, and Adam is just all over the place. He's, you can find him all over the place. He's got his tested channel, and I think it opened a lot of doors for us, but you know, it's, you can't be recre recreated, and it was a little sad at the passing, and this Saturday is the last episode of Mythbusters, so we kind of all got back together for the last episode to reminisce a little bit, and I, I may have cried. Right. Next question. Uh, my name's Caesar. This is kind of an irrelevant question that I want to I ask. love irrelevant questions. Bring it. Did you ever meet the guy, the narrator who narrates a portion of the show? Oh, yeah. Robert Lee? He's, he's a character. I like him. Um, he somehow always ends up making me buy him a drink. I don't know. <laughs> he hasn't shout me back like he said, like once, but he is awesome. <laughs> question up here at top. Um, I was just wondering, what would be your uh, favorite Jim Henson project? I mean, The Dark Crystal was, was very near and dear to my heart. And as a child, they showed you a picture earlier. I very much resembled a Gelfling. My ears always come through my hair like this. So I don't know if you're familiar with The Dark Crystal, but as a child, just imagine me with wings. <laughs> okay, other question. Where do we have one over here somewhere? About one in the back here, way back. Um, I'm sorry, this question, okay. Okay, I'm sorry, this question isn't really about Mythbusters, but as an artist, like how would you start your career as an artist? God, I wish I knew. I, I think you just go for it, because I never ended up a famous artist, so maybe I am the wrong person to ask. <laughs> Aqua, did you have a question? Coming over here. Yeah, what made, what made you initially leave Mythbusters? Uh, it, uh, did they cut our part on the show? <laughs> the budget, honestly, the budget got cut so dramatically um, through the network that they, they couldn't go on the same way, so they had to figure out a way to go on with half of what they were doing before, and that was the solution. Uh, what inspires your art, and also, are you still low punk rock? <laughs> punk rock's dead, man. Anybody who says they're punk isn't punk anymore. <laughs> um, you know, my art's always either been inspired by the, the things that scare me the most or the things that I find beautiful. So I find the patterns that back powder leaves on a piece of paper very beautiful, so those are usually very abstract paintings that I do, and then um, a lot of the things that I, I try to work through, as most people would do with meditation or therapy, I put into s clay. Question back there in the back. Mike's coming. Hi, my name is Tevin. Um, I was just wondering, uh, do you remember the myth you guys tested uh, where um, if you were wearing uh, metal jewelry or had a microchip in your arm, Oh, do uh, if I it would remember? Get, if it would get rolled, if it would get pulled out in the CAT scan, do you still have that? Do I still have the RFID implant in my arm? Yes. Uh, that was just proving how far I would go for the show. I had an RFID chip implanted deep into my arm so that if you had scanned me with like a, one of those grocery store scanners, you'd get a 16-digit number that was supposed to correlate to medical records. And we put me in a CAT scan to see if it would be ripped out of my arm and I, I don't know why I said yes. I have a hard time saying no when it's something interesting. And so I for, I think I had it in for like five years. And then all these studies came out um, about the possibility of leaving uh, something in your body that was a foreign object uh, was maybe not the best idea. And you know, I found out to get it removed, it would have to be like a surgery that they put me under to remove it, and I figured I'd do it while I was still on the show, because then I, they would pay for it. <laughs> so I do not have it anymore, but I have a lovely scar to prove it. And the conspiracy theorists got real freaked out by it. 
There was all, I got so much email about that RFID chip. It was such a small part of a small story, but a bunch of people thought that I was in lieu with the government and that they were tracking me or I was tracking them if they were really crazy. You're being tracked right now. Could be. We have technology here. I got a phone in my pocket, I'm being tracked. Any questions left in the audience here? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that, um, or read actually. <laughs> Yeah, I heard from all my associates from around the, no. Yeah, I read online that you no longer do any exhibits because the success you've had sort of distracts from the actual intention of the exhibits being your art. Is that true? And if it is, do you intend to maybe go back to doing more exhibits? Um, you know, it, exhibits are, are also a lot of work and very hard, and I'm very entrenched in production for a couple of things right now. I still throw stuff into group shows every now and then, and I do, I put stuff in for uh, charity events and that sort of thing, but I, I mostly keep it all in my studio, or I was, I did use a fake name for a while just for fun, because that way it's, you know, people come to see art, and they, you know, if you, I, I don't necessarily... I love Mythbusters and I love all the Mythbusters questions, but your art is sort of your heart and soul, and so it's, it's hard when nobody cares about that part. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's pretty much true, but you can find me in group shows in San Francisco all the time. Okay, so for the sake of time, we're gonna do, uh, okay, we got one more question in the back. So you threw out the Wolverine reference earlier. Uh, who's your favorite superhero and why? Oh, man, that is tough. You know, for the longest time, um, you know, Wonder Woman was my daughter's hero. Loved Wonder Woman, so I became fascinated with her as well, and I, I kind of like her powers. But, I mean, if I had to pick somebody besides my daughter's favorite, I love Batman because his superpower is that he's super smart and he can compete with everybody with all of the superpowers just by inventing cool gadgets that do cool things. And I've always been attracted to the bad boy. It's, I'm the nice girl, so. Okay, on that, we'll ask, <laughs> one, we'll ask one last question. If you could impart one th takeaway thought to all the people in the audience as they leave today, what would that be? Um, I think I'd go along with the, I mean, because most of you guys are students here, so I would say, Definitely take my advice on the internships because it's it's going to take you where you need to go and travel before your knees give out. Go travel. It'll give you a world view that will it will come with you for the rest of your life. Thank you very much, Carrie Byron, everybody.